Hello, everybody. Welcome. So thanks for joining us today for our first session of the Winter Lunch and Learn series uh, brought to you by the External Committee at the Graduate College of Scholars. My name is Heidi Exner, and I will be the moderator for this afternoon's session. We're very excited for our two scholars to have the opportunity to share their presentations with you today. So we'll start off with some opening remarks, and then I'll introduce our presenters. They'll each have about 20 minutes to share their presentation with us. And at the end, there will be a Q&A period. So you'll have the opportunity to answer or to ask questions for both of the presenters. Um, please use the Q&A box to enter your questions at any time during the presentations. And uh, you don't have to wait until the very end to ask. So finally, we will conclude our session with a short summary at the very end. So I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy comprising of Siksiksa, uh, Pinugi, Kina and Kenai First Nations, as well as the Sutsina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chenakee, Bears Paw, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis First Nation of Alberta in Region 3. I would also like to take note that although we are connecting virtually today, the University of Calgary is situated on the land adjacent to where the Bow River meets the Elbow River. And that is the traditional Blackfoot, uh, which is the traditional Blackfoot name of this place, which is the uh, Mokin Sidsi, which we now call the city of Calgary. So what is the Lunch and Learn series all about? Well, it's a public presentation series that aims to bring the graduate college to, uh, with, the, with the Calgary community. Um, our series has been ongoing since April of last year, and we're continuing the series uh, well into the foreseeable future. During each Lunch and Learn presentation, graduate scholars present their diverse research for the public. So without further ado, today we have Brandon Craig, who is a Master of Science and, or sorry, an MD and a PhD candidate in neuroscience at the University of Calgary. His research investigates innovative strategies for uncovering neuroplastic mechanisms of responses to early injury seen in perinatal strokes. His presentation today will be specific to how the brain adapts and develops around these early injuries. And then next we have, thereafter, we have uh, Govin Perengod, who is a PhD candidate in neuroscience. And uh, he will share with us a presentation on the emerging role of astrocytes as key players in blood flow control and associated implications to understanding of vascular diseases and aspects of neuroimaging. Govin's research seeks to uncover mechanisms that link chronic uh, stress to the emergence of mood disorders in order to improve methods of their treatment. Okay, Brandon, so the floor is all yours. Please take it away. All right, uh, can people can see me? They can see the screen. All right. Okay, um, thank you for that introduction. Um, my name is Brandon Craig. I'm a fourth year MD PhD candidate at the University of Calgary and first year graduate college scholar. Um, today, I'll be talking about how we can um, use photography to understand how the brain can change following around early injury and how uh, I use photography um, or how I used MRI as photography. So just a little bit of an outline, uh, I'm gonna talk about perinatal stroke, um, this idea of neuroplasticity and how the brain can change. Uh, how can we understand this neuroplasticity? How can we take pictures of it? And then finally, how can we take pictures of it uh, in children with perinatal stroke? So perinatal stroke is a type of brain injury that occurs um, 
right before or right after birth and leads to a lifelong weakness to one side of the body. And this is called hemiparetic cerebral palsy. So this happens in about one in 1200 to one in 1500 births. Um, and actually uh, the first week of life, so this perinatal period, um, you actually have a higher risk of having a stroke compared to an adult that has um, high blood pressure, type two diabetes, and is a smoker. So it is a really critical time. And um, when we think about this weakness to one side of the body, sorry, I'm gonna try putting on my, my laser pointer here. Um, when we see this weakness to one side of the body, uh, possibly the most popular patient that we can think of is this, is this character, Nemo, and I hope you guys can all recognize him. Um, but, you know, uh, it's tough to confirm that he does have perinatal stroke. The, the MRIs won't go into the ocean, but you can see here that he has this uh, weak and uh, unaffected fin on half of his body. Um, but I just want to point out that, you know, even though he has this weakness to one half of his body, that he was still able to um, swim across the entire ocean and do some pretty amazing things. So i just like to point that out because um, you know, some, some of our kids and, and most of them are able to uh, go on and do some really amazing things with, uh, with their life. And just speaking about these children with perinatal stroke, um, I just wanted to show you guys a, a, a picture of a child who has had a perinatal stroke. This is Brandon. Um, he's wearing a cast on his arm here. This is actually his, his good arm and this is his uh, affected or weak arm. He's wearing a cast on his gut arm, actually. It's part of a rehabilitation just to focus um, on using his, his weakened hand to try to get it to function a little bit better. But as you can see here, he's just a, a typical developing boy other than this weakness to one side of his body. Um, but yeah, I'd just like to show everyone uh, kind of the, the patients that we're, we're dealing with. So the, the point of my talk today is to try to convince you that um, that the brain can adapt to these early injuries. So in this picture here, this one day old baby, this white area here, this is the stroke. And this would be absolutely devastating if this size of stroke would happen to any one of us that are on this call. But the idea that this stroke happens so early on, the brain is able to develop around this injury to help support this lack of function. So throughout my talk today, I want you guys to be focusing on this non-lesion side. I'm going to be referring to that as the non-lesion side or the contralesional side, which is basically just the opposite hemisphere up to wherever this stroke is. So the idea of the brain adapting, we can call this neuroplasticity or the ability of the brain to change and adapt to different stimuli or injury. And one example of, uh, of this I found out uh, when I first started in working in my lab was when, when we're actually a newborn baby, the right hemisphere of our brain uh, not only controls the left side of our body, but it also controls the right side of our body. And same with the left hemisphere, it controls the right side of the body and the left side. And then throughout normal development, these ipsilateral pathways degrade and allow for these natural contralateral pathways to form. So most of us to here today, the left hemisphere of our brain controls um, the right side of our body. However, in perinatal stroke, sometimes these kids don't have these pathways, so they have to rely on the same side or ipsilateral pathways. So this is just one example of, um, of neuroplasticity. And now I'll go into how can we capture this neuroplasticity. So this is the MRI machine, magnetic resonance imaging machine at the Alberta Children's Hospital. It used to look like uh, an MRI, but they decided to put a spaceship in front of it just to make it a little bit more uh, child friendly and they seem to really enjoy it. Um, but I'm just wanting to show you a little bit of diversity here of what this machine can do. So here um, we're showing a diffusion uh, tensor imaging scan, which I'll go into a little bit later, but this is basically just showing the connections here and the colors um, just show the direction. So blue is the connections going up and down, red, it's going side to side and green, it's going front to back. And here is just a standard, we call it an anatomical scan, just to kind of get a picture of what's going on in the brain. And this is actually my brain here. I've always wanted to include a picture of my own brain on a presentation. So um, this is a dream come true. So now I'll go into a little bit of mechanisms around neuroplasticity. 
So there's this term called diaschesis, so which means a change in structure, function, or metabolism in a distant but still highly connected region following a brain injury. So for example, if you have an injury in this part of the brain, you might see a change in structure and maybe at this part of the brain or a change in function or metabolism in this part of the brain. So it's not directly a part of this injury, but it's still connected and might see some changes. So now I'll, I'll kind of go into the first few studies of my PhD, uh, where we investigated specific regions of diaschesis within the brain. So first up is the thalamus. The thalamus uh, is in the, the center of the brain, and it's a central relay station for numerous systems within the brain. Um, so all of the information that you're getting visually, um, from moving, from sensation, most of that information is traveling through the thalamus to go out to, towards the body or out to a different part of the brain. So it is a critical um, uh, kind of central part of the brain. And we know that in adult stroke, that there is this uh, thalamic diaschesis, they refer to it as the thalamus getting a little bit smaller if you have a stroke to the same side. So, um, but this has not been shown previously following a perinatal stroke. So what we did was we brought kids into the children's hospital. Um, we got typically developing children who have had um, no neurological issues uh, throughout their life. And we're able to um, basically see all of the different sizes of different regions within the brain. And here the arrow is pointing to the thalamus here. So, um, and then we have children who have come in and they've had a stroke. And then we're able to do the exact same thing and measure the different parts of the brain. The thalamus here, I'm going to refer to this as the ipsy lesional thalamus or on the same side of the lesion. This is the lesion here. So ipsy lesional just being the thalamus on the same side of the lesion. And right, we're, we're trying to see if the size of the thalamus changes following a perinatal stroke. So we have one um, type of stroke here, an arterial stroke. We have a venous stroke. These are two different mechanisms, but they have very similar symptoms of this weakness to one side of the body. And then on the y-axis here, we have the, um, the thalamic volume here of this thalamus here on the same side of the lesion. And then, sorry, here on the x-axis, we have typically developing kids. And what we can see is that both the uh, arterial stroke and the venous stroke have a smaller um, thalamus that's on the same side of the lesion compared to what would be typically seen in a, in a typically developing child. Now, like I mentioned before, I wanna focus on the non-lesioned hemisphere, understanding um, how that develops to support the injury. Now we're gonna look at the contralesional thalamus. And what we can actually see, which is really interesting, is that the arterial groups actually have a larger thalamus on the non-lesion side compared to a typically developing child. So potentially this could be neuroplasticity, maybe it's making up for this, um, injury that's on this side. Um, but what's really interestingly, really interesting is when we take the size of this and we correlate it with their motor function, which is what we did here. So um, I apologize, it's a busy slide, but we'll go through it together. So we have three different motor assessment tests that are testing their motor performance in children with perinatal stroke. And on the x-axis, we have their motor scores with larger scores here being indicative of higher motor performance or better motor function. And then on the y-axis, we have the size of the thalamus that's on the non-lesion side. So for the first graph here, we can see that a larger thalamus, again, on this non-lesion side, is actually associated with poor function. And that a smaller thalamus on the non-lesion side, this contralesional thalamus, is actually associated with better function. And this is not only just on one test, but you can just see this trend here with, it's very consistent between these three different motor function assessments, which is uh, kind of emphasizing this point that the larger the thalamus is in this non-lesioned or contralesional side, um, the poorer the clinical function is. Just to give, uh, give you guys like an example of this, um, the, this, this non-lesion side trying to maybe make up for this lesion that's on the other hemisphere. 
So this is the thalamus. Now we'll talk about a different um, part of the brain called uh, the cerebellum. So the cerebellum sits at the very bottom in the back of the brain, um, right here in this picture here. Uh, it's involved in motor control. There's been some evidence that's uh, shown that it's involved in behavior, learning, language. Um, and also interestingly, it communicates with the opposite hemisphere. So the left cerebellum will communicate with the right hemisphere and the right cerebellum communicates with the left hemisphere. So when we're talking about cerebellar diaschesis, um, we know that it is present following stroke in adults. So if you have a stroke in your, maybe in your left hemisphere, your right cerebellum would be smaller. So we, that's well known in adult literature. It's been shown in childhood stroke, but again, it has not been investigated following a perinatal stroke. Again, the, the, they're the strokes that happen um, right before or right after birth. So similarly to the thalamus project, we got kids to come in. We simply measure the volume of their uh, cerebellum. Um, here's the lesion here on this patient in the left hemisphere. Um, and then, um, yeah, so we, we measure the volume. We refer to this ipsy lesion cerebellum, which again is gonna be communicating with the non-lesioned um, uh, hemisphere. And then you have the contralesion cerebellum that's communicating with the lesion hemisphere. And what you can see here is that the contralesional cerebellum is actually smaller compared to the ipsy lesion cerebellum, which does show that cerebellar diaschesis is present following a perinatal stroke. But again, uh, like I've mentioned before, I want you guys to focus on the non-lesion um, hemisphere and how that influences uh, their motor function. So here we're just looking specifically at the ipsy lesional cerebellum uh, that's communicating again with the non-lesion hemisphere. Um, and we have this cognitive pediatric stroke outcome measure, and we've separated them into outcomes of poor and outcomes that are, are good, which I think is fairly self-explanatory. Um, and what we can see is actually the larger the cerebellar volume is on the ipsy lesional side, which again is communicating with the non-lesion hemisphere, actually has a larger for the poor group compared to the, the good group. And further, we have this total score of this outcome, which does include motor function. And very similarly, we can see here that with the, the larger scores, which is indicative of worse function here, um, that the higher the cerebellar volume is, which is communicating again with the non-lesion hemisphere, the worse the function is. So the main point of these uh, first two papers is just to show this idea that the non-lesioned or contralesional hemisphere is, is playing a critical part in their developmental trajectory uh, of motor function in these children who have had perinatal stroke. Yeah, just emphasizing the non-lesion hemisphere again. Um, so the next step that I wanna to go towards is diffusion tensor imaging or DTI in perinatal stroke. So uh, what this imaging technique uh, using MRI tries to do is to understand the white matter of the brain. You can think of white matter as the roads that would connect a house to another house. So these are going to be um, giving information from one area of the brain to another. So what we can do is we can take all of these roads in the brain, if you will, and all of these different houses or regions of the brain and we can map what is connected to what and how strong are these um, regions connected with here like a thicker line um, being more connected from one region to the next. So this is really interesting. It gives us some really cool pictures, but what we, what we uh, like to do using this um, information is this thing called graph theory. So graph theory attempts to um, take uh, basically maps of connectivity and try to understand different patterns within it. So you can look at the efficiency of connectivity, you can look at the complexity of connectivity, um, but for just for purposes of time for today, I'm only going to talk about this thing called global efficiency. So simply put, it's the average shortest path to go from one region to another. So if we're in Calgary here and we want to go to Toronto, it's way more efficient to take a flight directly to Toronto than it would be from going from Calgary to Regina to Winnipeg to Toronto. 
So I think that's pretty self-explanatory. The shorter the connection, the more efficient it would be. So how do we assess this in perinatal stroke? Like I mentioned before, we take this um, diffusion tensor imaging that looks at the connectivity, we map it along the regions, and then we're able to see the efficiency of the brain. So for example, it would be more efficient if um, region 27 had a direct connection to region 14 compared to going from 27 to 32 to 31 to 14. And an important part to note here is that we're only investigating the non-lesioned hemisphere. Um, we're only able to do that because the size of the stroke um, in some of our children is actually so large that we're not able to investigate that side. Um, so we're only looking now at this project at the one hemisphere, the non-lesion one that we've been talking about um, throughout the duration of this talk. So here we have uh, global efficiency with higher scores here being more efficient. We have two groups here, again, the arterial uh, strokes, the venous strokes, and then typically developing. And interestingly enough, in the non-lesion hemisphere, it is more efficient compared to typically developing kids for both the arterial stroke and the venous stroke. Sorry, I'll just repeat that again, just to let it sink in, is that this hemisphere here, uh, opposite side of the stroke is more efficient compared to a typically developing peer. But what's interesting again is now we can take their global efficiency score and we can correlate it with their motor function. So again, we have the uh, Melbourne assessment and the assisting hand assessment. On the x-axis here, um, as you go right, you have better motor performance and then um, yeah, here more efficient up top again. Um, and what you can see is that the um, more efficient this hemisphere is here in the non-lesion hemisphere, the worse their clinical function is. So the less efficient, the better the function. And this is consistent across the Melbourne assessment and the assisting hand assessment. So um, showing some, some slight clinical evidence of how this non-lesion hemisphere, um, you know, if it's, if it's more efficient for the kids that we might see in clinic, uh, we might see poor outcomes when, uh, when we're doing testing. So the main point that I just want to, I want to drive this home is that this non-lesion hemisphere is showing this potentially increased efficiency or connectivity compared to typically developing kids. Uh, however, this efficiency um, seems to be not benefiting them in the ways that we may think. Um, so this is just uh, to kind of give like a brief overall summary. Um, again, we're focusing again on this non-lesion hemisphere and how this acts as like a, a scaffold to help support this brain injury. And potentially we like to use this term called compensatory neuroplasticity, or basically this, this hemisphere might be having to compensate for this lack of ability on this lesion hemisphere that has this stroke. And one, um, hypothesis that has been um, used is this idea of crowding theory, that there's just so much now going on in this hemisphere um, that it, it's losing its ability to do the tasks correctly and appropriately like it's supposed to do. Um, and one um, slight evidence uh, of proof that we've shown in our previous paper is now we're looking at all of the regions of the brain here that have at least 1,000 to 10,000 degrees uh, or connections uh, from one region to another. So this region uh, has a, between 1,000 to 10,000 um, connections to another region. And I don't need to show you the statistics. You can just see visually that both stroke groups have um, a lot more connectivity at this level compared to typically developing kids. So this is some slight evidence showing that crowding theory might be a possible explanation for why we're seeing this increased efficiency, but um, poor function. Um, there are uh, many other graph three metrics that we've used. Um, if you are interested in it, I would suggest going reading this, or if you have trouble sleeping, um, it might, uh, might be good for you to put you to sleep as well. Um, and we were actually fortunate enough to be on the cover of, uh, of this journal here with, uh, with our figure. So um, myself and my lab, were all really excited about that. Um, just to bring it back to the kids, though, um, this was uh, Brandon that I had showed in the first uh, couple of slides, and 
um, just a text that our lab had received from his mom that he was so excited that he was finally able to open up his thumb uh, following our intensive rehabilitation um, uh, clinical trial. And uh, um, I, I think it gives me motivation, it gives my lab motivation to understand what's going on in Brandon's brain now. What are the new connections that are being formed that are allowing his, his hand to open and uh, just allow him to have this improved motor function and improved quality of life. Um, so yeah, I, I, I hope that this gives you kind of like a, an understanding of where we're coming from. Uh, as most of you know, uh, research cannot be done alone, and I'm very grateful to be a part of uh, an amazing lab in the Curtin Lab that I'm in. Um, and a big thank you to all the people with an asterisk by um, their names who have helped me specifically with these papers. Um, and also thank you to my um, funding agencies. And thank you for your attention. And now I will, uh, I believe, pass it off to Govind. Yes, thank you, Brandon, for that wonderful presentation. Um, so just a quick reminder to our attendees that if you have any questions for Mr. Craig, to uh, please use the question and answer box. And we'll go through the questions during the Q&A period at the end. Uh, so now, Govind, uh, you can go ahead when you're ready. Perfect. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Okay, so uh, let me switch here between presenter and get my laser pointer on. Okay, perfect. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Govin. Um, I'm a PhD candidate um, in the neuroscience program, also here at the University of Calgary, um, and a first year um, graduate scholar. Okay, so changing gears a little bit, um, my work is um, more in the uh, realm of basic uh, neuroscience. And uh, what we aim to do is um, develop, um, you know, a better understanding of the underlying physiology of the brain um, to enable the discovery of uh, you know, new uh, pharmaceutical or therapeutic approaches um, uh, based off of that. So uh, we are changing gears a bit and my talk will mostly revolve around the use of um, animal models to understand um, the role of a subtype of uh, uh, cell in the brain um, known as astrocytes. Um, and, uh, uh, I, you know, I will talk about how um, astrocytic function relates to neuronal function and how that relates to um, overall brain activity as well. So um, to give you a quick roadmap, um, first I'll talk to you about the, the neuron drop doctrine, which is this idea that um, neurons are, you know, the key players in the brain and um, all neuron, all brain activity um, relates to the um, integrate and fire functions of uh, uh, neurons primarily. Um, second, you know, we'll look at the emerging role of uh, a group of cells called um, glial cells in the brain, uh, a subset of which are astrocytes, um, and how that's kind of revolutionized um, neuroscience um, in, in recent years. Um, we'll talk about um, two specific functions of astrocytes um, that our lab, uh, the lab that I'm in, is interested in. Um, one is brain blood flow regulation, and the second is, um, you know, their contribution to the pathophysiology of chronic stress. Um, and chronic stress associated conditions um, like depression. Okay, so the kind of overarching uh, theme of this talk will be uh, to push back a little bit uh, against this uh, neuron doctrine um, by really showing you the, the role of uh, glial cells and especially astrocytes in, uh, in uh, overall brain function. So, um, as I was preparing this talk, I came across this uh, cute little cartoon um, on the Neuroscience for Kids um, section of the U Washington website. Um, and uh, it's quite interesting. So, you know, there's this glial cell that says, hey, you know, it's complaining, why doesn't anyone talk about me? Um, and the neuron responds, well, you don't really do anything, that's why. Um, however, the glial cell responds, that's not true, read this page. And that's a plug for, you know, kids to go on the website and read that page. However, I thought it was quite interesting um, because, you know, um, 
uh, glial cells and especially astrocytes are really involved in the uh, visual aspect of uh, decoding visual information and processing that information in your brain and uh, interpreting that as an image. Um, in particular, uh, a subtype uh, of astrocytes called uh, Mueller cells um, in the retina um, are actually oriented in a way that you know, they act as single cell optical fibers that convey photons from the environment outside to photoreceptors of the eye um, with minimal loss and distortion. Um, and secondly, there's also uh, evidence that astrocytes in the brain um, are actually, uh, in, within the visual cortex, are um, more sensitive to uh, certain wavelengths of light. Um, and their um, astrocytic cellular activity is actually indicative of uh, the second stage of visual processing. So, you know, a, a simple um, cartoon like this actually belies the fact that, uh, you know, glial cells are uh, really important in the brain. Um, and this is becoming, you know, more of a, um, a prevalent theme uh, within the literature as well, uh, especially over the last 10 to 15 years, um, with this idea that we should move from a neuron doctrine or neuron centric uh, brain to more um, uh, encompassing glial cells. Um, and thinking of glia as much more than just, you know, the neuron sidekick. Um, and quite importantly, that neurological diseases, especially the neurodegenerative ones, um, are actually gliopathies and not. Um, you know, what we conventionally think of as purely uh, a neuropathy where neurons are breaking down. Um, so this is kind of the, uh, what I'd like to talk to you about today. Um, and, uh, you know, just to set the scene here, you have a simple schematic of what the cellular distribution is like in the brain. Um, so you have your neurons. These are the most, you know, sexy cells, the ones that are flashy that people typically associate with, um, uh, you know, as, as being uh, the key kind of substrate for memory and learning and um, general brain processing. So you have your neuron. Um, then there's uh, a group of other cells collectively known as glia. Um, so these are, you know, microglia, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes. Um, and these cells are actually vitally important in, uh, in maintaining neuronal function. And for a long time, these cells were thought to be the glue of the brain. And that's it, just connective tissue that, you know, keeps neurons running. Um, but we're, what we're finding is that they do a lot more than that and, uh, in fact, are essential players, um, sometimes even more so than uh, neurons themselves. Okay, so my talk is going to focus on a specific type of glial cell called astrocytes. Um, and here, you know, I just wanted to walk uh, you through uh, some of the early work that was done and show you, I guess, the, uh, the relative uh, importance that was given to neurons over astrocytes. So in this uh, uh, you know, set of images here, um, we see you know, the very early uh, drawings that were made of, uh, of uh, astrocytes in the brain. So in the in 1850s, as I said, uh, Virchow described neuroglia as just connective uh, tissue that neurons are embedded in. Um, more towards the, the 1890s, um, histology, detailed histological work and, and staining work actually began to delineate um, glial subtypes from neurons. Um, and they began to identify important functions of glia, um, like their association with uh, uh, blood vessels um, and controlling kind of um, blood flow. Um, so at this point in time in the 90s, there was very limited functional data and it was all postulated that because of where they are and how they're oriented, they may have uh, important uh, additional functions than just being you know, mesh that neurons are embedded in. Um, in the early 20th century, um, you have, you know, speculation of more of these active roles. Um, blood flow was an early one, but also synaptic support. This idea that all these cells that surround neurons may actually be contributing to their function in a, in a very important fashion. 1950s, you have the advent of uh, electrophysiology, which is the ability to, um, you know, actually record current signals from these cells, um, as well as radio tracing for more of the anatomical um, uh, pieces. And then in the 80s, um, you know, you have the development of cell cultures and, and tools that actually enable you to study uh, glia in tandem with, uh, with their neuronal um, uh, uh, colleagues. And so what we see is actually a trend where technology, technological improvements actually have enabled um, rapid advances. And this, uh, as you can appreciate, has really accelerated over the last 20 to 25 years. Um, so I'll, I'll just walk you through quickly, you know, some of the key um, uh, findings that have driven this area. Um, it's a busy slide, but, but we can walk through it. 
Um, so first of all, you know, on the left-hand side here, we're going to talk about um, uh, structurally identifying astrocytes and labeling them and understanding where they are, how they're located uh, in the brain. And on the, on the right-hand side here, we'll talk more about the functional aspects. So in terms of structure, uh, electron microscopy allows you to study, you know, at the very, very fine spatial scales, um, what the interaction is between glial cells, in particular astrocytes and neurons. So in blue uh, outline here is, um, you know, an astrocyte uh, membrane. And you can see that it's actually, uh, you know, in, in the gray here, uh, close to the astrocyte are all uh, neuronal uh, uh, neurons. Um, so you can see there's a very uh, close spatial association between the two cells. Um, furthermore, uh, you know, once tools became available to, to label astrocytes uh, specifically, uh, for example, this GFAP marker, um, which allows you to, uh, you know, uh, visualize astrocytes within uh, brain tissue. Um, the dark uh, regions here are all just general brain tissue that is non-astrocytic. Um, and the, the red here is, is marking astrocytes. So as you can see, uh, this is marking uh, just the, the cell body of the astrocyte, whereas in green here, it's still showing an astrocyte, but it's showing all the fibrous kind of processes that the cell has. And when you overlay the two together, you can see uh, in, in much clearer fashion um, the contrast greatly improves and you can see the, um, the astrocyte in, in, uh, in full view. Um, so what uh, this kind of technology has enabled is the ability to look at how astrocytes are oriented in the brain. And it's actually fascinating because astrocytes um, tile the brain. Um, each individual astrocyte has its own kind of domain that it operates in. Um, and that astrocyte contacts millions of, uh, or hundreds of thousands at least, of uh, neuronal uh, synapses. So um, basically that kind of sets the stage for uh, kind of a domain territory that each astrocyte has and the astrocyte's ability to uh, at least uh, communicate with neurons, if not uh, directly uh, affect their function. Okay, so now um, the second set of technical advances were more so on the functional side. I mean, here, uh, you know, the key kind of piece here is the ability to Take a piece, uh, take a cell within your uh, tissue, patch clamp it. So what this means is you just stick two electrodes into it, one that measures your uh, voltage level, and the other, if needed, you can inject current into that single cell. Um, so what this allows you to do is, for example, you could patch a neuron versus you could patch an astrocyte and look at the, the electrical properties of that cell. Because as we know, elect uh, electricity is kind of the uh, sets the governing rules for uh, how these cells operate in the brain. So um, when you do these uh, experiments, what you see here is um, this PYR is a pyramidal neuron, which is a neuronal subtype. Uh, INT is your uh, interneuron, which is another type of neuron. Um, and AST is your astrocyte. So here what they're doing is during this experiment, they inject current um, into, into one of these cells and they look for the responses. So very clearly you can see that you know, your, your neurons are your sexy cells, right? They're the ones that integrate and fire um, a very temporally localized um, signal. Um, and these signals have you know, been very clearly shown to be associated with the cognitive processing capabilities of the brain. Um, so that's really cool. But astrocytes don't do anything. Like they're electrically non-excitable. Um, and that's due to the um, distribution of uh, ion channels on its surface. So for a long time, astrocytes were just thought to be, again, kind of useless, just hanging around, um, not contributing much. Um, however, what's uh, really kind of the technical advance that um, pushed astrocytes and glial cells into the forefront is the discovery um, that you can image calcium in the brain. So now we move from just electrical currents to very specific ions that are flowing. So in this um, schematic here, what you're seeing is you know, you're poking the uh, poking uh, an astrocyte with your with a fine tipped electrode, and what that induces is a calcium wave that spreads out from uh, from the center. Um, and so this type of imaging really uh, allows you to probe functional aspects of astrocytes in ways that we couldn't really do uh, less than twenty years ago. And uh, let's see if this will play. So here you can see kind of the dynamics of, uh, of astrocytes. They're very dynamic active cells. 
Um, and all um, of these processes contact you know, hundreds of thousands of neuronal synapses, which um, sets the stage for the communication between these cells. Okay, so um, uh, you know, the, these advances have actually enabled a, a great deal of research, which um, has elucidated a very large um, set of very important functions for astrocytes in the living brain. So this is under, um, you know, just the healthy brain. It's not a disease state. Um, and so, um, you know, there's several functions. I'm not going to go through all of them. We'll talk about uh, two of these in detail. Um, but, uh, you know, astrocytes are involved in molecular homeostasis. So when um, these neurons are, you know, firing action potentials, um, they release a lot of uh, uh, ions into the extracellular space. Those have to get cleared. Otherwise, it's toxic for neurons, um, and astrocytes have been implicated um, to be uh, in this, involved in this process in a very key fashion. Um, they've been found to be important for systemic homeostasis, and this is quite a recent finding um, where their astrocytes are actually have um, the ability to sense things like uh, O2 tension in the tissue, carbon dioxide, pH levels, and actually um, signal back to neurons and say, hey, um, you know, systemically something is different. Um, let's uh, restore uh, the, the global state back to, uh, to, to a healthy um, set of parameters. Um, importantly, they've been in, uh, implicated in metabolic homeostasis uh, and more, uh, most importantly in the regulation of local blood flow. So we know that blood flow is really important to the brain because neurons need oxygen and glucose to, to respire and to do their um, activities. But what actually controls this um, uh, is, you know, on the, on the short time scale, neurons directly signal to blood vessels for, to dilate and bring more metabolites, uh, uh, metabolic nutrients into the area. Um, but on a longer time scale, astrocytes um, have, have been found to be really quite important um, players in shaping that response and, and making sure that the right amount of blood reaches the right area at the right time. And uh, finally, uh, they're really important in cellular and network homeostasis as well. Because as I said, they tile the brain, they have a lot of calcium activity uh, and other um, uh, metabolic activity. Um, and they themselves form a network that nourishes and supports uh, the neuronal network. So um, I'm being very, uh, you know, very generalist here and keeping it at a high level, but um, there's been a ton of research um, that focuses on, on these aspects. And they're uh, it's gotten to the point where you know glia are coming to the, the really the forefront uh, just in terms of thinking about uh, neuropathology um, and just uh, even in the in the healthy brain as well. Um, so really importantly, one uh, thing that came up uh, recently is this idea of uh, of glymphatic flow as a way to clear uh, extracellular junk from the brain um, and and just as the garbage truck kind of uh, of the brain. And astrocyte, uh, astrocytes express aquaporin-4, which allows them to shuttle water. Um, and dissolved in the water, you have these um, kind of waste components that can actually be taken out of the, of the brain tissue. And that's actually a really important function that was recently identified. Um, the other kind of key piece here is that astrocytes are directly able to control synapses, uh, both structurally and functionally. So structurally, um, astrocytes uh, and other glial cells are actually able to go in and phagocytose, um, that is, you know, degrade and eat up pieces of, uh, of neurons that are not necessary or are not efficient or for whatever reason uh, that needs to be done, uh, these are the players that do it. Um, and secondly, just the way astrocytes are located in, uh, in brain tissue, they um, tend to form, let's say, barriers between different synapses. Um, or um, they tend to um, uh, actively remove uh, or release uh, substances that enable neurons to improve or reduce the strength of communication between synapses. So these are all very real ways in which astrocytes control neuronal function. Um, and this was, you know, there was very little appreciation for this about 20 to 30 years ago. Okay. So um, now to focus a little bit uh, on, on two components. So this is, um, you know, this was the focus of my master's research. Um, and uh, basically the, the idea that I want to try to sell you here is that astrocytes regulate kind of the delayed component of uh, the 
uh, blood flow response in the brain. So functional hyperemia is just the process by which um, blood gets to uh, the right area of the brain. Um, so you have here an increase in neuronal activity, which increases the blood flow, which increases tissue oxygenation. Um, and when the activity is complete, it goes back to its uh, regular state. It's a very complex process. Um, and uh, uh, neurons are implicated, um, they have to be implicated in the early component of it. So when they need um, energy, they ask for it. Um, but astrocytes are actually uh, thought to be the, the players that um, uh, sustain that response and uh, ensure that it's efficient, that blood is um, actually getting to where it needs to get to um, uh, and shaping that response, but maybe also even restoring things back to normal um, once the uh, neural event is complete. So we've been looking at this um, for quite a while um, and how we do this is we have uh, an animal preparation where we can create a cranial window um, and use you know, light to study the brain through that window. Um, and so, uh, that, together with um, a you know, very extensive set of uh, molecular uh, techniques and, uh, and uh, transgenics especially, allow us to specifically look at astrocytes in the living brain. Um, and what makes our preparation quite unique uh, globally um, is our ability to study that in awake animals. So a lot of this work has been done in anesthetized animals, and that completely um, has been shown to be uh, uh, can, uh, I guess, uh, not reporting astrocyte activity uh, properly, because um, anesthesia is a, is a real confound when it comes to studying uh, uh, astrocyte contributions to blood flow. So our ability to do it in the, in the awake animal as it's behaving is actually quite important. Um, and I won't go into how we do it, but we do use um, you know, uh, fairly expensive microscopes and, and, uh, and lasers to, uh, to perform these experiments. Um, and the animals are fully awake, they're running, uh, ambulating on the ball. Um, and uh, while they're doing that, you know, in their um, uh, physiological kind of state, that's when we're making these measurements. So here I'll show you again a video um, of what this looks like. So this is the window. And as you can see, we can see uh, uh, oxyhemoglobin, deoxyhemoglobin changes uh, within the window. Um, but actually quite uh, interestingly, we can see the cellular uh, effects here as well. So we have the blood vessel that's dilating in response to uh, neural activity. What you're seeing in green here is actually the astrocyte calcium signaling when that happens. So using this kind of an experimental approach, we're able to very precisely study the activity of uh, single cells and, uh, and small networks of cells. Um, and what this kind of uh, culminated in um, for, my, for my master's um, is this identification that um, the oxygenation response in awake behaving animals is biphasic. So when your stimulation is prolonged, um, so more than, let's say, uh, five seconds, um, astrocytes slowly begin to turn on and their calcium activity is directly linked to the, um, uh, you know, the second phase of uh, blood flow increase uh, that you see here, so in S2. Um, and so uh, this actually is quite important because the delayed um, blood flow response is actually modulated by behavior of the animal as well, um, which we know to be uh, linked to astrocytes more than it is to uh, uh, any given set of neurons uh, in a, operating in a uh, local area. Um, but quite interestingly, um, this is work that I collaborated on with uh, one of the postdocs in my lab, is um, if we are able to um, selectively turn off astrocytes. So in this case, what we did was uh, we created an animal model where we could reduce um, calcium activity specifically in astrocytes in that region. So this was a, a viral injection that was done um, in that area of the brain. Um, what we see here is actually quite fascinating because in the short, you know, less than five seconds uh, whisker stimulation, you have, uh, uh, you know, these two uh, traces here. The, the dark one is your normal condition. Um, and your pink trace is where you suppress astrocyte calcium activity, um, you see no difference. But in the 30 second stimulation, you see a very clear difference, um, which suggests that astrocytes are actually involved in the late component of functional hyperemia. And uh, so this is kind of our model is that astrocytes turn on later than uh, neurons uh, you see here in black, green is astrocytes and the blood flow is kind of an average response of the two. Um, 
what is the real significance of this? Well, so uh, uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging uses um, a blood uh, flow response to interpret neural activity. Um, and typically um, the, the field uses generalized linear models, um, but what a group uh, uh, found recently was that when glia, so when astrocytes are active and engaged and turned on, the uh, bowl signal actually becomes nonlinear um, as compared to when only neurons are active. So what this actually uh, questions really is, is uh, you know, the fundamental uh, application of uh, uh, bold fMRI imaging that is not corrected for the uh, involvement of astrocytes. So uh, basically this work you know, kind of points to a new set of models that has to be developed so that we are um, you know, studying fMRI signals properly. Um, and this is quite important because usually fMRI stimulation paradigms are longer than, uh, than typically the five second paradigm that, uh, um, that they rely on for interpreting signals. Okay, and finally, um, I'd like to talk to you about what my PhD project is going to look at. And this is the role of astrocytes more so in the pathophysiology of, uh, of uh, the emergence of mood disorders. So stress uh, and chronic stress has actually um, been implicated in, uh, uh, in several changes to astrocytes and astrocyte networks, specifically the density of astrocytes, so the, the total number in a given area, um, the morphology, what an astrocyte looks like, um, the genetic expression profile, so what uh, proteins they produce, um, as well as how they're connected, so the gap junctions that connect uh, networks of astrocytes. These are all changed under uh, stress. Um, and furthermore, antidepressants that we use to treat stress-associated conditions um, actually um, change the structure and function of astrocyte networks as well. So this begs the question, um, you know, um, how can we improve our understanding of, you know, what happens at the fundamental level um, so as to improve our targeting for um, uh, therapeutic approaches to treatment um, or just to understand you know, what the, um, what the dysfunction actually looks like um, and, and what's caused by. Um, so I won't belabor the details here, um, but uh, I'm actually quite interested and excited to start this work because there was a paper that came out quite recently uh, and very high impact um, where they showed that astrocytes um, uh, actually phagocytose adult synapses in the hippocampus um, and affect you know, circuit function in that area. So what I want to ask, uh, you know, in my PhD work is, um, do astrocytes actually engulf synapses in specific brain regions, um, prefrontal cortex, for example, um, following chronic stress? Um, is this significant? Um, second, I want to ask, you know, what are the mechanisms by which astrocytes actually target specific synapses for deletion um, and then actually go ahead and phagocytose them? Um, and third is, you know, uh, if we are able to inhibit synaptic engulfment, i.e. astrocytes eating parts of neurons directly or indirectly, um, Will that ameliorate behavioral outcomes in animal models of uh, chronic stress-induced depression? So these are actually really quite important experiments to do because it, again, improves our understanding of where stress disorders um, originate from um, and how we can design new kind of unconventional therapeutics that are, that are really glia-focused uh, and we expect will be uh, more targeted um, than, than uh, existing techniques that we have now. Um, so thank you so much for your time, uh, and I'd really like to thank my uh, uh, lab members who um, not only supported my research and uh, uh, and helped me along, but really inspired it, um, and you know kept me wanting to do a PhD even after a master's. Thank you, Gavin, for your presentation. Okay, so uh, we had quite the brainy presentations today. Um, so we're going to open the floor now really quickly for any questions from the audience's brains for either Brandon or Govind. Um, please make sure to use the Q&A box and feel free to ask questions related to their presentation or anything related to um, their work and area of research.
Sorry, guys. Sorry, right, guys, some technical difficulties there. <laughs> so I'll just put this screen up for your reference um, just to give you an overview of both Brandon and Govan's work. Okay, so we do have one question for, um, for Brandon. So now that we know more about the non-lesion hemisphere, like how it works and how sometimes the changes it makes can cause negative outcomes, what can we do about that? That's a, that's a great question. So um, I didn't have enough time to, to get into it, but we actually have some clinical trials that are going on right now um, where we use um, extensive occupational therapy uh, combined with non-invasive brain stimulation. Uh, it's, a, it's a method called transcranial direct current stimulation. And what it does is we can put just like a, a saline sp uh, soaked sponge electrode over top of a certain part of the brain. And we send a weak electrical current that goes through the skull onto the surface of the brain. Um, and you're able to uh, enhance basically more or less um, certain parts of the brain. Uh, and now that we know, um, now that we can use neuroimaging to understand what specific targets are involved in their motor function, uh, we can kind of tailor our approach to um, these therapies and uh, hopefully be able to help these kids a little bit more. Um, right now we have a, a large clinical trial, multi-site clinical trial right now going from uh, Montreal, uh, or sorry, not Montreal, Toronto, Edmonton, and Calgary. And uh, we're in the middle of it right now. Um, I think we have one more summer left of it. Um, and then uh, we'll be able to share those results. Awesome. Thanks, Brendan. Um, and I think we've got time for a quick question for Govind as well. Um, so you've spoken a lot about um, astrocyte function and the healthy brain. Other than mood disorders, are these cells implicated in brain diseases? Yeah, that's a great question too. Um, so I've, you know, spoken about, um, you know, how astrocytes are involved in kind of synaptic um, activity regulation, and that's kind of where the the mood disorders piece fits in. Um, however, all the other homeostatic functions of uh, of astrocytes um, are potential areas where um, their dysfunction can actually lead to uh, brain uh, pathophysiology. So, so in particular, for example, uh, neurodegenerative diseases um, uh, have a component where astrocytes are primed to attack um, typical normal neuronal components. Um, and they're primed to do this due to some change that happens uh, globally in the brain or elsewhere systemically in the body. Um, and uh, basically astrocytes get reprogrammed um, is what we're finding. Um, they get reprogrammed to act as kind of killer cells or um, uh, really destructive elements within, within the brain uh, parenchyma. Uh, and when this happens, usually things you know, just continue getting out of control. And we do think that that could be um, what underlies many of the neurodegenerative conditions that, um, that afflict uh, so many people. Awesome, thanks very much, Govin. So I'm going to stop my screen share now. And um, yeah, uh, those are the questions that we have time for today. So thanks very much to both of our presenters for sharing the research with us and to all of our guests for taking the time to, uh, to join us out of your busy week in participating in the Q&A session. Uh, your questions are greatly appreciated. It was a pleasure to, uh, to have everyone here joining us for our lunch and learn. Um, so please feel free to connect with the Graduate College on social media or by visiting our website for more information about upcoming events. We hope to see you soon. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks, Heidi. Thanks, Heidi.